So this is a presentation that originally I gave with Wonderlust in Belgrade and Livingston, and then I modified it for more plant-oriented people. And um, this is the, the region that we study. So we go from, here's Red Lodge, and then you go up the Rock Creek Canyon, and here are the infamous uh, switchbacks. And from about here, right south of the, um, north of the um, Wyoming border, to Beartooth Pass, that is the ideal alpine environment, the ideal um, uh, cushion plants and uh, dwarf plants and all that. Once you get to Beartooth Pass, you start down more and get into below timberline uh, things. So I'm going to be covering the whole, the whole road. Um, notice that the Beartooth Plateau is right here, and it's one of about four or five plateaus in this whole complex. So there's a Silver Run Plateau, there's a Hell Roaring Plateau, there's a Line Creek Plateau, there's a Wyoming Plateau that doesn't show here, and then there's the, uh, another one over here uh, that's kind of the Absorca Beartooth Plateau. Um, so it's a whole complex of plateaus and mountains. Um, so I'll be covering from Red Lodge to Cook City and actually Silvergate, which is the uh, mouth of the uh, gate of Yellowstone Park. The, as again, I say the ideal uh, exemplary alpine stuff is this area right in here uh, between the Switchbacks and Beartooth Pass. So why is it so special? Well, the scenery, of course, glacial activity and stream activity. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have been to the um, Colorado Plateau um, in, in um, Rocky Mountain National Park. That's the other great alpine example of this flat surface with um, meadows above timberline, timberline effects. Um, it, they're fairly rare. The, these kinds of, of topographies are pretty rare. And then the, the geology is really spectacular, and I won't get into that so much, uh, but there's a lot to be seen with the uplift of a plateau rather than mountains folding and uh, uh, faulting. Patterned ground is very special. I'll talk about that. Believe it or not, there are fossils up there at 10,000 feet, lakes, streams, and so on. So it's a spectacular place. So you know, Geology 101, how did it get so high? Well, the Cretaceous and Eocene building of the Rocky Mountains called the Laramide Revolution started um, actually a little before the dinosaurs went extinct. So they, the dinosaurs were around at about the time that the, this area started being lifted up. And then these are plates um, that crash into each other between the Western United States and the Pacific tectonic plates and this crashing together of these plates formed the Rocky Mountains. This crashing together tended to be greatest in the Colorado Rockies and the um, uh, Canadian Rockies. That's where the mountains are highest. Um, so we have the benefits of some kind of a medium kind of building here. So what can happen to the land? Well, it can go down and up, making kind of valleys and mountains. It can go up like this, making folded. This isn't showing folding. This is just showing faulting, where a rock slip past each other. But you know, we know around here there's lots of folding of rocks because you can see it. You know, when you go up like um, Bridger Pass, uh, and then volcanism is frequently associated with mountain building. So the whole Absorca Range. And a lot of the Gallatin range is formed by um, volcanic activity. And then you can have sideways movement of the land as well as up and down. So here's kind of what happened with the Beartooth Plateau area. Some of it went up, some of it went down. So the Bighorn Basin went down, the Beartooth Plateau went up. So we have this incredible difference in elevation between the like the Bighorn Basin and the um, Beartooth Plateau and the whole plateau region, and then down and up and so on. So just as a reminder, mountains are more uh, common 
because of the tilting and folding and faulting of the rocks. And then we have these incredible regions where the land was just lifted kind of straight up. And that forms these really interesting plateaus, like the Beartooth and the um, Hell Roaring and all those. So the area actually was used by uh, paleo humans, um, early American Indians, more than 10,000 years ago. And there's a whole history now that Shane Doyle is working with on, on um, a lot of people of this area a long time ago. So the Crow Indians were here, the Shoshones were here. Uh, Chief Joseph, when he was chased out of Idaho, went through this area. He went through Yellowstone Park, but he, they think he didn't go over the, the plateau. He went around through the Clarks Canyon area to the south and then back, you know, when he tried to get to Canada to get away from the troops. So he almost made it uh, to the Bear Paws and then gave up. So the first white exploration they think was John Coulter. Um, you know, when he broke away from Lewis and Clark and described a lot of things here. Trappers, of course, were here. And the first real uh, explorations were by General Philip Sheridan, 1882. So notice Yellowstone Park was a park in 1872. So Sheridan in 1882, and from there on, things caught on. So the first real, interested, real interest in getting um, a road built was after cars started being really popular. So for a long time, to, the way to see Yellowstone Park was via horse and buggy and stagecoach. Um, when people started getting cars, they wanted to be able to get to the park. So um, interested in building a road started in 1925, actually in Red Lodge. The funding came in 1931 when Herbert Hoover was the president and he signed a bill called the Levitt Bill and that was an access bill um, how do we get to national parks? Even at that time, they were interested in the commercial aspects of how to get people into the parks. So most construction, 1932 to 1936, several contractors from um, usually mostly from Minnesota. Um, but imagine height of the depression, all of this labor, you know, this gave a lot of work to a lot of people. And I did talk with people from Red Lodge who had uncles and grandparents and so on that worked on this road. It was dedicated June 14th, 1936. So to get there, um, I usually start in Red Lodge because I'd rather go up the switchbacks than down the switchbacks. And Red Lodge is about 5,600 feet in elevation. So you head southwest on the main street of, of um, Red Lodge and you start going up the canyon. Now, when you get up a little ways, you can look to the right and you see a really perfect glacial feature. This is called a U-shaped valley. So when glaciers come down out of the mountains, they chip away rock at the sides of the mountains. And um, well, they aren't mountains then, it's actually flat. But as they move down, they chip away the sides of where they're flowing and they make these U-shaped uh, valleys. So this is the West Fork of the Rock Canyon, and this is perfect U-shaped. So compare that with something like the Gallatin Canyon, which is a water cut. And so water cut valleys tend to be V-shaped. So glacial canyons, U-shaped, um, water cut valleys, V-shaped. I under I haven't been up there for a long time. The upper part of Hyalite is U-shaped and you can tell where the glaciers stopped moving because then Hyalite becomes more V-shaped. So as the workers were working on this road, they named everything. So these names came from the workers that were working on the, the road in 1932 to 1936. So this is coming out of Red Lodge and you make a couple of switchbacks like this and they name them as you go up. Here's the Vista Point. And I'll talk about that because you can get out of the car and use the restrooms and walk out and look at things from there. And then as you go up, to here, you start getting into white bark pine right about here, and there are a lot of little turny points right here, and they named that the May West turns. Remember May West, maybe? And then go on up onto the top of the plateau. 
there's a creek that starts up here. This is a soggy area right up here on top. And it starts um, this creek that comes down here called Quad Creek. And because you cross it four times on this road, um, they call it Quad Creek. So I've always been interested in what stabilizes this slope. And obviously, there are lots of flowers and grasses, yay for the plants. Um, obviously, some avalanche tracks here, and also some mud flows. I'm sure that's what this fence is trying to prevent, this, you know, some protection from mud and rock slides. And then what stabilizes this area, this isn't exactly a picture from there, is our friend the subalpine fir. So subalpine fir layers, you know, the lower branches grow out from the bottom and it's usually under the snow line where it's kind of protected, or at least they stay protected under the snow and the branches grow out and then they root. So you have this whole little complex here of skirts that come out of subalpine fir. So this is a true fir. You can tell what's above uh, snow line here because this is pretty battered. I'll talk about that. And then remember that firs are flat and friendly. So um, you never see a cone with, with subalpine fir. It, they, the cones start as these purple things like this, and they're very soft. And then as the seeds mature, all the scales fall off, the seeds fall off, and then you have this little stick sticking up. So if you ever done, have done skiing in Bridger Bowl, Piers Knob, the lift at Piers Knob, you can see those little sticks that stick up from the, from the subalpine fir up there, and those are the remnants of the axis of the cones right here. So this is subalpine fir. This is my favorite Christmas tree, actually. It's, um, this, the bark is very smooth. It's tall and skinny. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It smells wonderful, and it's very, very sappy when it's fresh. So here's the vista point that I pointed out. Um, you can get out of the car. There are lots of restrooms there. And then there's a walkway where you can walk out and look over to the Wyoming Plateau. So um, this is whitebark pine right here. And associated with whitebark pine, we have the Clark's Nutcracker. So I hope you can see it. I can't see his face, but um, lots of this... Uh, lichen right here is called wolf lichen or Lotharia, and it's very a characteristic of the western part of the United States and Scandinavia. So the Clark's Nutcracker has this uh, very hard beak, and it picks the seeds out of the pines. Um, one number that I actually saw today was I, my number has been that one bird can move 30,000 pipebark pine seeds in a year. And some recent research says, no, they can move any place between 35,000 and 85,000 seeds per bird per year. So the importance of that, of course, is these birds don't migrate. So they know the slopes where they can store and cache these seeds, and then they feed on them all winter. So here's white bark pine. Um, hard to over or underestimate the importance of this tree. And in fact, there was a really interesting uh, presentation this morning from researchers at Yellowstone Park working on whitebark pine in the Yellowstone ecosystem, you know, all the way from north of Bozeman to southern, su uh, south of Teton Park. So they're really studying this tree because it's in, it's really endangered at this point because of global climate change. Um, the white pine blister rust doesn't freeze out in the wintertime, and this tree is becoming decimated by this b blister rust that grows on the stems. So evidently, the spores enter through the, the leaf tips, and then they grow through the leaves into the branches and into the trunks, and it's really, really harmful to the five-needle pines white pines. So white bark pine is a member of the five needle pine group. You know, the, the needles are in bunches of five. And it's also a stone pine. 
So here are the seeds of what's called the stone pines, and that's kind of a European term for these uh, trees, the pines that have these wonderful nutritious seeds like this. So quite, uh, Clark's Nutcracker is huge in making seeds available because it plants them, caches them, and then the grizzly bears dig up those seeds. They don't climb trees. They dig up the seeds. So it's a major food for grizzly bears. And then squirrels, um, mice, voles, all kinds of things feed on these seeds. The other thing that they were saying, and I'll get back to this later too, is that because the climate is getting warmer, um, you can start seeing dead patches of this white bark pine as you go up the Beartooth Plateau, as you, as you get above the Vista Point and then up uh, going toward the plateau, you can see big dead patches of this tree. And then remember a few years ago, we had that uh, beetle, um, the pine bark beetle infestation. And what they said this morning was that lodgepole pines, lodgepole pines tend to be more resistant because they evolved along with the pine bark beetle but the pine bark beetle, because the weather was colder, did not make it to these higher elevations. And now that the, it's getting warmer and the winters aren't so cold or so long, the beetle is able to survive at these higher elevations. It's attacking the white, the white bark pine and becoming a real problem. So you know, some basic ecology here. What determines the plant life and growing seasons on the Beartooth? Well, uh, snow, for one thing. Uh, one thing to remember is this is a spectacular picture, but the snow is not uniform across the plateau. So there are wind-scoured slopes, and that's where the, the uh, birds plant cache their white bark pine seeds. But in other places, there's lots of deposition. So snow plowing usually begins about Memorial Day on the Beartooth uh, to open up the highway. And then, of course, wind. So you all know what wind does. It carries blowing snow, blowing dirt, all that, and it scours off the growing buds on the windward sides. So the trees can't make new growth on the windward sides. They can make new growth on the lee sides. So you get these really lopsided growth forms with less growth on the windward side and then more growth on the lee side. Gotta mention the rocks because this is kind of a oops, special place. This is where basement rocks are visible. These are Precambrian metamorphic rocks more than 2.5 billion years old. So the belts have some of these in some other places in Montana and certainly in Canada. So the three ones that you can really see if, if you stop and get out and look. Um, there's some white quartzite that is just beautiful. So this is re, um, recrystallized um, quartz which is igneous, and then quartzite is the recrystallized metamorphic to make quartzite. White and beautiful, and it's by the chromite mine that I'll mention a little later. In some places, when you look real closely at the rock along the, the road on the left as you're going up the road, you'll see kind of a shiny area, especially if it's moist, and this is schist. So I call it shiny schist, and this is recrystallized shale that has lots of mica in it. So it's shiny because it has the mica in it. So shiny schist. And then if you heat and compress and metamorphose uh, granite, you get this striped rock that looks like striped granite and that's called nice. So nice, nice and shiny schist. These metamorphic rocks that are visible mostly at the very top of the switchbacks and not many other places unless you know where you're looking. So at the top of the switchbacks, you're at the top now, and you look to the right, and you can see this wet area that has the low willows and heath plants, and a little farther on are the alpine meadows, and then there are these islands of crumb holes. So crumb holes means crooked wood, German term, and we've seen this picture before, but you can see the part that's of the trees that can survive 
the wind and the snow and the elements, and then this um, low growth, this layering, the skirts that are forming these islands right here. So in these islands, this shows uh, subalpine fir, but there's also white bark pine and Engelmann spruce. And then one of the things I learned as I was learning about the bear tooth is that 50% of the bear tooth plant species are also in the Arctic tundra. So this is one of those, the dryas octopetala, eight petaled dryas, that forms these wonderful mats. And they're frequently almost surrounding some of these little uh, islands at the top of the switchbacks. Now the chromite mine, you're not gonna see unless you get out of the car at the top of the switchbacks, cross the road, go up the little uh, embankment, and then walk around and you can see the remnants of an old uh, air airline, airstrip, because during World War II, they were mining chromite here that had something to do with, I forgot what it was, something to do with war metal efforts. And they were afraid they didn't have the supply that they needed from South America. So they were trying to mine the chromite at the top of the Beartooth. Now the chromite is part of this huge stillwater complex that uh, Nye and, and um, Fishtail are known for, for palladium and platinum in the Beartooth Mountains to the north of here. So there's this huge complex of this, um, these kinds of rare metals that are kind of important in the Stillwater area. The chromite mine is just a big pit in the ground. You can't really see what, the, what it looks like now, except the pit is still there and the remains of the airstrip are still there. Okay, now you get into these islands, the, the flag trees. So no question that you can guess here from which direction is the prevailing wind blowing? Obviously from the left, right? Because it's scoured off the growing buds here. The other interesting thing that we found in some of these islands, this is when we were teaching the course up there, were these big round, I mean, these are probably eight to 10 inches in diameter. And they're the remains of huge white bark pines that at one time lived at that area. Uh, which indicates, you know, there's been some climate change that evidently at one time it was warmer up there and we got some some pretty substantial growth of white bark pine. Now, how hard is it? It was so hard that the burliest college guys that I had in the class could not core it. You know, we have these little core cores that you use to determine the size, the age of a tree, which is really easy to do if you've got a nice growing tree. These things are like rock and they could not even begin to make a core of these. So we have no idea how old they were, the size of the growth rings or anything. Just kind of interesting. And they'd be right lying in here, like here in these islands. So one question that frequently is answered is, what's timberline here? Like there's a line. <laughs> so it's basically an elevation above which trees do not grow. Wood is present, and I'll talk about the dwarf and cushion plants. So timberline is a, a, almost a nebulous kind of concept, and it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the general climate, the latitude. You know, timberline toward the equator is generally much higher than timberline toward the, the poles. Um, moisture availability, temperature. Um, this is something that was real hard to get the, the college kids to understand that the temperature decreases about 3.5 degrees per 1,000 feet climb in elevation. That means if it's 20, you know, 80 degrees in Bozeman, will it be 80 degrees on top of the bear tooth? And can you wear your shorts and tennis shoes? Duh, they didn't get it. Um, timberline also depends on local factors like wind, north, south, east, west, uh, which is aspect. It depends on the slope. You know, if it's gentle or, or very steep, the soil's present. So it's, you know, just, you cannot usually give a specific elevation for timberline unless you're talking about a particular mountain, a particular um, site almost. And by the way, there's also a lower timberline. And below that we have grasslands or deserts. 
So again, back to this area at the top of the switch, switchbacks, which is kind of moist and soggy. And there are these wonderful heath plants um, up there. The two kinds that we have <clears throat> are the mountain heath and the alpine laurel. Both of them are there. And then three kinds of alpine willows. So I'm not a real specialist on willows, but I know that Kathy Cripps has worked a lot with the um, mycorrhizae on these alpine willows and with all of the alpine plants. <clears throat> She's also worked uh, um, with the mycorrhizae on the um, white bark pines. So these are at the most knee high, and I'm not very tall. So these are maybe knee high and I'm short. Um, and they're in the wet places at the top of the switchbacks. So most of the highway is in Wyoming, in the Shoshone National Forest, which is the first national forest that was formed, and it's the largest in the Rockies. I'm thinking maybe the Tongass in Alaska is the largest. Maybe somebody can help me with that. We spent a lot of time on an alpine meadow here because even though it looks kind of the same from one place to another, it's really, really different. So there are three major micro topographies. So we have some kind of rocky areas like this and here. And those are called fell fields where there's a lot of loose rock. Um, and this is where the cushion plants are. So pictures of those later and the most, the largest number of lichens. Okay. Lichens don't compete well with anything. So they do really well in these rocky areas right here with the cushion plants. Then there's a more moist turf, and that's this yellow plant here, which is Alpine Athens or GM Rossii. And then there's a moister areas, moister areas with grass and sedge. So does Champsia and Carex. And they're very distinct. You can take two steps and be in one or the other of these things. And it's entirely dependent on aspect and slope and soils. And you just have to, this is the kind of thing where we, we're on our hands and knees looking at these, at these communities. This is called a glacial erratic. And I'll mention those later. Um, glaciers move around boulders and they can move rocks, boulders that are larger than water can move usually, and then they deposit them on a substrate that is not the same as they are. So frequently this is one kind of substrate and this is a granite kind of thing that had to have come from someplace else, obviously moved by glaciers, more on that later. So these alpine meadows, this looks kind of boring, but the, when the kids got through the class, they usually said, oh, I'm going to bring my parents here and get them down on their hands and knees so they can see what's here. So here are dwarf plants. Dwarf as in maybe calf high, a little bit higher than your ankles, certainly less than knee high. The most common one of these is GM Rossii, Alpine Avens. It's a rose family plant. And at the end of July, the last weekend in July, basically, the meadows are yellow with this flower. They're just glorious, wonderful. And then sticking up a little bit higher than them, there's lots of this right here, which is um, bistort, American bistort. And then, oh, okay, this is hidden. Let's see if I can change this. Got it. So there are two references that we kind of cross-referenced here to find out exactly what to expect. And one of these references is, that I'll mention later, is called Beartooth Country, and it's about uh, the whole Beartooth Plateau and the mountains and all the, the flowers there. And then another book that was published in Missoula on Alpine wildflowers of the Rocky Mountains. So between our own observations and, you know, the people who, I'm going to mention these people now, Jan Nixon and the late Ron Batchelor who had worked in the Arctic, so he was really pretty familiar with what we find on the Beartooth. Uh, identifying all these plants, we identified about 90 alpine forb species in 66 genera between the top of the switchbacks and Island Lake Campground. So that includes 
uh, Beartooth Summit, as well as going down into the subalpine area. And then Lakshevit, some of you might remember him, did a whole study on the whole Beartooth country, not just the mountains, but also um, the plateau. And he names 370, 327 species of trees, forbs, and ferns, and 102 grass and sedge species from between 9750 feet and 12,000 feet. Um, so that includes the plateau, but it also includes the mountains. And then 130 of those plants are considered Arctic alpine. That means you can go to Canada and Alaska and find the same species as you find on the Beartooth. So the dwarf plants are just short versions of uh, other plants. The cushion plants are my favorites. They're just, they're just lovely. A um, couple of the most common ones here are the moss campion, Silenia collis, no stem. And if you look at these, if you would cut down through them, they would be branched like a deciduous tree. They're woody and they have incredible amounts of branching. Um, but it just branches into this cushion shaped. So this nice bright pink color, very common. Again, um, where the soil is pretty rocky, they're not every place, but where the soil is pretty rocky, you can find these cushion plants. Another pretty one here is the alpine forget-me-not, the same kind of structure. You cut down through it and you have this little structure like a, a miniature deciduous tree. So as a by the way, this is calcia, uh, which we don't have. It's not on the bare tooth. It seems to be a Northwest Montana plant, but it is one of these cushion plants that's found in the Alpine. So we'll see more of these later, but these are, these are my favorite kinds of plants. Again, growing where the soil is pretty rocky and not much else grows around them. So there are areas up there where it's pretty moist and you get these um, meadows with the bistort and um, Indian paintbrush. And here's a glacial erratic right here. And then not above timberline here, but here's timberline. So timberline just comes and goes as you go across here. Got to mention the animals because they really affect the plants. I've never seen a pocket gopher. Um, you have to trap them and they're very wary and Bob Moore trapped one once and I missed it and then he let it go and um, I never did see it. But they're a little rodents and they, they chew roots underground with their teeth. But they, they as they tunnel through the earth, um, they remove the roots the root material and they deposit it on top of the ground. So that makes that makes for a very unstable ground because it's partly hollow as you walk on this ground. So here's the kind of thing we actually see along the trail behind my house um, where they make these mounds where they bring the mountain the dirt material up and deposit it above the ground. And then under the snow these are called eskers where they deposit it more in long reverse tunnels. It's not exactly a tunnel. It's the esker is a, a glacial term for deposit under, under snow and water carries the deposit to make these long kinds of um, deposits like this. The bottom line is it makes for a very unstable ground. And there are places all over Yellowstone Park. There are places in the park behind my house where the ground is unstable because these little critters are eating the roots under the ground. And I got to mention the little red fox that kept me company one day as I was on my hands and knees collecting some data. And I looked up and here was this little fox just looking at me like, what are you doing? So I kind of told him what I was doing and he said, okay, and then he ran off. So I know there's fox up there. Mountain goats um, are kind of a problem, it turns out. They were planted in the Absorcas in the 1950s. And so they're not native to this area, they're native to Northwest Montana. 
but in the in the, this meadow that we were studying in the class that I mentioned, you can see some real bare spots, some blowouts where the wind is blowing um, the soil. And these mountain goats roll in it, like you've heard of buffalo wallers. Um, mountain goats roll kind of the way bison do, and they make these bare spots, and then the wind blows them out, and you get these bare places where the mountain goats have been. So Yellowstone Park is looking real carefully about what to do about the goats. They're not native, but, you know, Yellowstone is contiguous with the bear tooth, and they're starting to move in to that northeast corner of the park, and they're kind of trying to figure out what to do about them, if anything. So they are kind of majestic. They're kind of cool. The babies are cute. So it's kind of fun to see the goats. This is bear country, both black bear and grizzly bear. So beware if you decide to camp up there. It's bear camping rules. So this is a typical glacial lake. Gardner Lake seems to be a magnet for late season skiers. I found out with some uh, kids in the class that decided to come up early and do some skiing here, like this. So this is July. Um, this is again glacial activity where the ice and melting, melting and refreezing ice chips away the sides of rock and makes bowls. And then the snow melts and makes these glacial lakes called um, glacial lakes tarns actually is the name for it. So this whole bowl shaped thing is called a cirque, as in circus. So this is not safe skiing as one of my students found out who spent the night in the Red Lodge Hospital. Twin Lakes is another one of these cirque, well two cirque type lakes. But they've got a T-bar there that they run part of the summer once you can finally get up to the top and there's still snow. So this is a training area, I understand, for some of the more hardy downhill skiers. And then notice this rock right here, and I'll mention this a couple of times. Most of the rock up there is granite. Not all of it. You've got the metamorphic rock um, at the top of the, the uh, switchbacks, but most of the rock is this granite. So the bear's tooth, These are, this is in the mountains, not on the plateau. It's visible from several sites along the road. And this is called a Matterhorn Peak, um, again, chipped away by glacial activity, ice and snow, chipping away uh, the, the rock to make this very sharp peak. They think that even the Indians maybe named this the bear's tooth. There are some other versions of how this is named, but you can see it from many places along the road. It's usually to the right. As you're going along the road, it's to the right. Here's my favorite place, Beartooth Path Summit, elevation 10,947 feet. So this is a feature called patterned ground. So as the glaciers were melting and the, wa and the, the ground was very soggy, uh, convection currents were set up in the soil. And you can picture kind of something is coming up in the middle of a donut and then going to the sides. And then the water would come up in the center, move to the sides in all directions, and then go back down. So the power of the water was such that it could move this rock like this. And these are one to two to three feet in diameter, these rocks. They're not, they're not pebbles. So you can imagine the, the power that this, um, this water has to move these. So you get this circular structures of different sizes. At the top of the Beartooth Pass. This is a great place also for the cushion plants. They're, they're, because the soil is pretty rocky. This is a wonderful stop. This is a must stop on the Beartooth. You gotta stop and look at everything that's here. So the rock you'll notice is kind of black. So how do you know that the rock is stable and not now moving? Okay, a rolling stone gathers no lichen. So this is um, a 
kind of a of a lichen called umbilicaria. It's built like a kind of a miniature parasol. It has a little umbilicus right here in the center, and then this is all unattached. So this is the, this dark color, uh, the intense colors that you see of the lichens in high elevations. Here's the same lichen at a lower elevation in the shade. Um, and you'd think these would be two different species, but frequently they're not. They're, they're the same. And here's the reason that we see this difference. So picture the structure of a lichen is kind of like an Oreo cookie. So it has a top layer and a bottom layer, and then a filling in between. So the top layer is fungus, and then the algal layer, algae, are right underneath this top layer. This is all fungus, and this is all fungus. So 85 to 95 percent of, of a lichen is fungus. Now, the algae are very sensitive to light. Too much light will kill them. If you decide to landscape with lichens and water the lichens in the sunlight in the summertime, you're going to kill them because this layer becomes very translucent when it is wet and that light can get down here and kill the algae. When it's dry, it has these pigments in it and the pigments protect the algae from too much light. Now this is one kind of lichen. There, there are variations on this theme. But the point is, um, the same lichen at this high elevation can be a very vivid color, and at lower elevation can be kind of pale. So, I, you know, observing lichens in different uh, parts of the country, the lichens on the East Coast tend to be kind of pale compared to the ones that we have here. They're just not as, they don't have that vivid color that we have. So how many species up there? Well, just in the meadows themselves, this is not counting the forest or the woods or anything. 80 species of lichen. 39 on the rock, 30 on the soil, and 11 on moss and detritus. So there, there's a fair number in this, just this small area of um, alpine meadow type areas. Here's where the pikas are most frequent, at, is at the top of the Beartooth uh, Pass. So you can get out of the car, pass through pattern ground, and go up to this rock area at the top, and sit at the top and look over at the headwaters of Rock Creek. And there's where the pikas live. These are relatives of the rabbits. So pikas don't hibernate. So they gather haystacks all summer long, and notice how tidy they are. You know, all the, the stems are going one way and the blooms the other way. And they make these little haystacks and they're all over in the rocks. And that's what they live on in the wintertime. Um, I don't have a picture of this, but when we were up there one of the times, they had a, one of the, this, these little critters had a bouquet of the GM rossii, the yellow flowers all here and the stems all this direction. It was a perfect little bouquet. And one of the guys in the class looked at it and he said, ah, I know what he's doing. He's saying, I'm sorry, dear. Then this yellow, this orange lichen right here is a lichen that likes nitrogen. So whenever you see this orange lichen, you know that there's some animal urine, some, some feces, some kind of animal deposits because this orange lichen likes nitrogen. So it needs the nitrogen from animal and bird droppings in order to, to grow. So that, especially on rocks, so you can see this in places in Yellowstone Park where there are marmots. Um, you can see it on cement where birds perch. On trees, it might be just nitrogen flow from the leaves and the branches down uh, the trees, not necessarily animal and bird droppings, but certainly on fence posts or rock where you see this right here, that's an indication of animal activity. Now, one of the things that they said this morning um, about monitoring the national parks for climate change 
is that pikas have disappeared from Zion National Park. Um, there used to be pikas there, and now it's getting warmer enough. These are cold weather animals. And once they're at the top of 10,000 feet, there's not a lot of other places they can go. So they're a little concerned about pikas uh, and climate change. Pink snow. You can look across and see these areas of pink right here. So this is a sign, an indication that the snow is melting. Here's this little alga right here called Chlamydomonas that has a little red eye spot right here. So this is one of these, is it plant, is it animal kind of thing, because it does have cell walls, it does have chloroplasts, but it also swims. So it's one of these, yes, it both kind of things. Now, when it gets warm enough, it swims up out of the snow and makes these resting spores on top of the snow, and that's pink snow. This is poisonous. Uh, this is not something you ever want to taste. Um, although there are birds that can live on this um, in the summertime. When I understand that when mountaineers see this during the wintertime, they don't like what they're seeing because that means that in the wintertime, snow is melting. And you don't want the snow to melt in the wintertime. You want the snow to, to stay up there and be part of the watershed. So pink snow around here is usually just in the summertime, but I understand in the Alps, they're having more problems with seeing pink snow in the wintertime, which is not a good sign. Now this is coming down um, off the Beartooth Pass. So Beartooth Pass is the highest area and pretty quickly you're down into subalpine areas where trees grow. So down a little ways, you go past several lakes, and here is Island Lake and Island Lake Campground, which is just a wonderful place to camp. It's very cold, um, but it's just beautiful. So it has both white bark pine and uh, lodgepole pine, it has granite rock that I'll mention in a minute, and then there's a lot of fishing in these lakes, but they're not self-sustaining. Uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department plants the trout because they don't have any place to go up and spawn from a lot of these lakes that are up there. Granite rock, so just a connection between Yellowstone and the Beartooth. If you've been in the Lamar Valley and paid attention to where the Douglas firs grow, you'll see that in many places they're really connected right next to a rock. This is a glacial erratic, they're usually granite, um, not the same as the substrate, so they know that they didn't originate in that area. And they were, they were probably the glaciers pushed them down or carried them down from the Beartooth. So this is the same kind of granite that you find up on the Beartooth Plateau. So the nurse rocks are where little seedlings get started here. You know, they can kind of cuddle up here to the rock and they're protected and maybe some water drips onto them here from melting snow. And so they, they're called the nurse rocks because they help the baby um, Douglas firs grow. So really common from, um, well, throughout wherever you see the Douglas firs in the Lamar Valley. Connection between Yellowstone and the Beartooth. I understand the same thing is true around Canyon, that they have some big boulders there that they think are Beartooth in um, origin. This is Beartooth Butte. Um, that's all sedimentary rock. A lot of it is Devonian, if you're into any kind of geology. Lots of fish fossils. The Devonian area in the Paleozoic, and this is before the age of the dinosaurs, a um, lot of fish fossils up here. So uh, early on, um, Bob Moore and Harold Picton, who started this alpine ecology course, were talking about some of their students who would go up and pick up fish fossils that were weathering out of the rock up here. And they were Paleozoic or uh, Devonian. So this is all older um, metamorphic rock and granite rock. Now to this side, I guess to the left we'll say here, is Clay Butte. 
that sometimes has a road open and sometimes does not. Um, it did have a road up when we were there and beautiful wet meadows on the sides of the hills going up. But on the top, you can see it's alpine. They have a, a fire lookout up there. But the most notable thing here was the instability of the soil. So walking around here was very unstable and that's because of the pocket gophers. So, um, you know, just some turf was there. Um, that was its claim to fame called clay butte because it looks like clay and because it's unstable to walk on. Look across to the, think probably the Beartooth Mountains and then on the other side back toward Beartooth Butte. Now visible all along the road are these two Matterhorn peaks <clears throat> um, that are actually in the Absorca Mountains and this is basaltic andesite. Um, so it's not basalt, it's not the, the black kind of rock that makes um, hexagons as it cools, and it's not the rhyolite that is the light colored stuff of Yellowstone Park. It's kind of halfway in between that, more on the granite side, and very, very choppy and very, very rugged. Ernest Hemingway has a story about, oops, doing some hunting in this area, um, trying to walk on these slopes and said it was just almost impossible when they were sheep hunting. So again, Matterhorn Peaks, this is Pilot, the tall one. This is Index, the shorter one. So remember Pi, as in life of Pi. So Pilot comes first and then Index, so Pilot Index. And then this ridge in between, again, is a glacial feature where the rock was chipped away on both sides to make this ridge, and that's called an arete. And sometimes that word actually shows up in jigsaw or in crossword puzzles. So I'm helping you out here. All kinds of views of these rocks for several miles of these mountains. They're just a huge, huge um, landscape feature. Obviously, we're below timberline. So coming down um, after Beartooth. Butte after Clay Butte, um, you start getting into the very definitely subalpine areas with beautiful conifer and S and aspen stands. And then late in the summer, later in the summer, especially along the roadsides, you see the pearly everlasting, just huge, beautiful stands of pearly everlasting and Indian paintbrush. So just um, memorable. Now, in order to see the Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone River Canyon, you have to stop at, vi at vistas and get out and look at it. So this is a designated wild and scenic river. This is not the Clark's Fork of the Columbia, which goes through Missoula. This is Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone River. And this was a dude ranch company, country years ago. Um, very, very popular. The fishing in the in the Clark's Fork and then the, now the boating and kayaking here. Uh, but you can't see it unless you get out and look at it. As you get back down into the forest, the Custer Gallatin National Forest, we're back in spruce country. So mostly Engelman spruce. And as you know, spruce needles are very sharp. They're not flat and friendly. They're very sharp. They make miserable Christmas trees because they smell bad and they hurt to decorate. Um, so lots of spruce trees here. And then of course, there's always lodgepole pine. So outside of Cook City, there are lots of talus slopes. And obviously talus slopes come from higher mountains that have weathered down. And we know that they're pretty stable because there's lots of lichen growth on it. So if there's lichen growth, the rock is stable. That doesn't make it any easier to walk on, but at least it's stable. And there's Cook City. And then Silvergate is Yellowstone National Park and the Northeast entrance. And then we're out of technically the Beartooth and back into Yellowstone. 
So there are, there are three super references that are still available through, through Amazon, last time I checked. One of them is very technical. It came out of Montana Tech years ago in 1995. And this actually has a, a road guide, a mileage road guide. So if you're into geology, you can order this and you can um, go from Red Lodge to Cook City and every tenth of a mile they will tell you what kind of geological feature you're looking at. Don't pay much attention to plants, but this book does. So Montana had a whole series, a geographic series years ago of different regions of Montana. And so this is just a beautiful book, Beartooth Country. Um, lots of biology and the illustrations are beautiful. And this is where they have the list of the plants that Lekshevitz did. So if you want to know the plants of this area, both alpine and subalpine, what was it, 9,712 to the granite, top of Granite Peak or something. Um, this, this is the book right here. For flowers, nice illustrations and descriptions, Alpine Wildflowers of the Rocky Mountains from Mountain Press in Missoula. Those were our Bible plants books right here. And then all you have to do is Google Beartooth Plateau and you can come up with all kinds of articles, technical, popular, all kinds of articles on anything you want to know about the bear tooth. And some things you don't want to know. Okay. So, the end. <laughs>